thanks for having me. It was, uh, this is my first invited in-person talk for two years, so I was extremely excited to get here and take a plane. Um, so yeah, so um, you know, when we consider the role of data in judgment and decision making, visualization interfaces are often relevant, and visualization is the area I work in, um, because visualizations influence how we interact with and make decisions from data and predictive systems in a variety of settings, you know, from daily life where we see model predictions related to things like elections or public health through visual, visual interfaces as well as visually driven exploratory analysis where we have tools like Tableau and other um, programmatic tools like R that people are using to make decisions in organizations or in science. And then finally, visualizations in the scientific literature convey results under uncertainty. And in these various settings, you know, visualization techniques are often preferred um, for interacting with data because they have this ability to offload cognition to perception, as we like to say, making it easier for us to identify patterns and relationships. So for example, Anscombe's Quartet, many of you potentially have seen before. It's a set of four data sets, which would look identical if we were to summarize these just using summary stats, like the mean and the variance of x and y. If we run a regression, we get the same regression equation. Um, and these, these four data sets were, were created specifically to show that you know, summary stats are limited, and when we visualize them, we immediately see aspects of distribution that we would otherwise miss. And so in the last few decades, um, research on uh, interactive visualization or information visualization has broadened from addressing only analysis, I would say, to consider um, you know, communication and decision making from data as well. Um, but when it comes to how we view sort of the function of visualizations um, and visualization systems that we're building, even within research, I would say that pattern finding is still kind of our common emphasis. So for example, if you look at the state of the art in visualization systems being published on today, our design ethos seems to be driven by what we might call behavioral optimizations. So you know, ways of making the data easy to access and to see so that the user can find patterns. Um, so we see advances like visualization recommender systems, uh, like Voyager that suggest views based on perceptual or statistical features. Uh, behavior-driven recommendation where we're learning from low-level interaction data to predict what view someone might want to see next. Uh, touch, pen-based displays, and speech and natural language-based displays. All under this, this guise of you know, making it very easy for someone to see the data, whatever modality is useful for them. So all of these forms of optimization would suggest that you know, as designers of visual, visual analysis tools and visualization systems, we just need to sort of give people access to the data, get, uh, make the system sort of get out of their way. It implies that we can assume that the user knows what to do when they see patterns in the data. We just want to sort of serve it up as quickly and efficiently as possible. And uh, the notion that visualization is about exposing patterns um, may largely be a carryover from the way that the, the field was sort of born um, as a discipline or some of our, our biggest influences. So Tukey, for instance, popularized this idea of exposure, as he called it, uh, or using graphics to understand what's in our data uh, before we know what to look for. He also talked about how graphs help us see what we didn't expect, um, help us sort of check our assumptions, and perhaps this has encouraged what seems like a pervasive view even today in HCI and visualization that you know, exploratory data analysis is mostly model free. Um, and certainly EDA is difficult to uh, sort of reconcile with applications of statistical modeling and statistical testing or what we would call confirmatory statistics. So for instance, it's not clear whether all of the activities in exploratory analysis like hypothesis generation are gonna be um, something that we can even fit within a confirmatory or a probabilistic framework. So there's hard questions about like what is EDA and how does it interface with other aspects of statistics. Um, and perhaps you know, the, these difficult questions make us fall back on this belief, maybe just simply because it's simpler, of thinking that you know, visualization is about finding patterns, it's about generating hypotheses, and it's less about checking the robustness of patterns. Um, but the consequences of uh, you know, prioritizing pattern finding over pattern checking is that our tools have some big blind spots. So to take just one example of an issue that crops up, um, consider you know, how we build defaults into visual analysis tools. So many systems for visual data analysis like Tableau will aggregate data by default. 
um, to basically enhance pattern identification when you have very large data sets. But of course, many companies and organizations and individuals are using Tableau and similar systems um, to look at small data and to make decisions from small data. So a couple years ago, we looked, uh, or we asked novice analysts to generate observations about a population um, as they assess statistical graphics showing them a sample from the population. And we recorded, in addition to their generalizations about the population, their confidence in these generalizations. And we varied kind of what data sets we showed them, varying things like sample size. And we either showed them aggregated data like the default in Tableau or disaggregated data. And what we found was that when people looked at aggregated data and began to reason about the population, they reasoned much more dichotomously about effects. So they would talk about how there was a difference or there was not a difference, um, but they would not say much about the size of that difference at all. It was just, does it exist or not? Um, we also saw uh, that people's confidence and the number of generalizations um, they came up with about the population tended to not be very affected by changes in the sample size of the data they were looking at. Um, so, you know, we would want people to be less confident in things that they think they see when the, when the data is suddenly much smaller. Um, but with aggregated data, you know, people miss, they miss cues about sample size that are actually quite important. Um, and so, you know, uh, these sort of blind spots in our tools, um, in many ways, I think, um, and much of my work has been about um, arguing are sort of based on a, a lack of sort of grounding in theory. And in particular, in theories of inference in the way that we're building visual analysis tools. So we need to help people see patterns, but we also need to help them understand what they're seeing and how those patterns generalize, how robust are they, so that they can make good predictions and decisions. So today I want to first motivate why um, I think a lack of theoretical grounding uh, you know, causes problems in, in research on visual analysis, practice in visual analysis. And I'm going to look at the area of uncertainty visualization, which I've worked a lot in, uh, in order to do that. Um, and then I'll talk about what kinds of theories of statistical inference I think have been helpful, for me at least, in structuring how I think about visualization and the implications for visual analysis and visualization tools. So once, I'm still sort of adjusting to talking in a mask, so mm -hmm. if I feel like I'm breathing heavily, <laughs> that's, that's the result. Um, so yeah, so back as a PhD student, I became interested in this topic of uncertainty visualization and found myself wondering, you know, why is it such a niche area in visualization? Because on, on some level, you know, variability and how variability compares to signal in data is, is sort of affects every decision we make from it. And so I became interested initially in the limitations of existing conventional uh, approaches to visualizing uncertainty or visualizing distribution is, is really all I mean there. And most of these techniques are static and they use either summary marks, things like error bars or box plots to uh, present statistical constructs, um, you know, properties of a distribution, or they use visual variables like color, um, you know, position, height, um, in, a, in a density, plot opacity, to show probability. And the problem with most of these techniques is that when we apply them, uh, or when we apply sort of canonical criteria for evaluating visualizations, um, we see some, some major issues um, with these kind of approaches. So summary marks, for instance, create what we could call expressiveness violations. So expressiveness means we want to use visual encodings that don't lead people to make inappropriate inferences about the data, so inferences that aren't supported by the actual data. But people often do this when they look at error bars based on the way the error bar looks to them. It conveys some false info. So these include biases like within the bar bias, which refers to how people um, tend to think that you know, the, the range of values denoted by the bottom half of the error bar, which is on top of the bar encoding something like a mean, is a more likely range of values than, the, than that on the upper half of the error bar, because it kind of looks that way, like this is somehow more connected to the data. Um, there's uh, other very robust bias called deterministic construal error, which is where people take a representation that shows uncertainty and they try to in interpret it as though it's deterministic. So for instance, in weather domain, if I want to give you an uncertainty interval around a predicted high temperature, even when you try very hard to tell people that's what they're seeing, there's still this sort of robust tendency to interpret it as the daily low and the daily high. Um, 
And finally, uh, there's you know, a lot of issues that stem simply from the challenges people have in interpreting some of the underlying statistical constructs that we're trying to show with things like error bars. So um, you know, there's been multiple studies at this point showing that psychologists and grad students have um, you know, make a lot of mistakes in trying to interpret how a 95% confidence interval relates to the concept of statistical significance. So even people using these techniques have trouble getting the interpretation right. And then there's you know, other common interpretations, like a 95% confidence interval is the value in which the true you know, population parameter would fall 95% of the time, which you know, seems kind of intuitive but is wrong because in a frequentist context, we can't talk about a population parameter having any probability. It's just a fixed value. Um, so the statistics beneath these things are hard. On the other hand, when we look at probability encodings as a way to encode uncertainty, we run into what we could call effectiveness issues related to how well people can read the data back from the visualization. The biggest problem is that we often want to use our most effective encodings, things like position, to show the data itself. And we tend to be left with less effective encodings to show probability. Um, so, you know, for instance, um, when we map you know, probability to height in a density plot, we run into issues um, where people uh, are trying to do basically one-sided probability intervals, um, and they have to rely basically on an area judgment to do it. And people are not good at area judgments. Um, the worst part is that some of the encodings that kind of look the most like uncertainty, so things like opacity and blur make people, people think semantically, semantically about uncertainty, um, but these are some of the hardest to, for people to read data from. So if I asked you, you know, what's the probability of you know, value here versus a value here, you'd probably you know, be very bad at that judgment. And so based on an understanding of these problems, I started to work on uh, the idea of frequency-based uncertainty visualization back when I was a, a PhD student, motivated in part by this robust finding from cognitive psych research that in some cases, re-expressing a probability as a frequency can help people better use it in Bayesian, Bayesian reasoning tasks. So rather than saying 30% of the time, we can say three out of 10 times. So frequency-based uncertainty visualization is trying to apply this discrete or frequency framing to visualization. And there's a few techniques that came out of this. The one that's closer to sort of conventional uh, visualization of uncertainty, but frequency framed as a quantile dot plot. This was a collaboration with Matt Kay, um, where we wanted to give lay people a represent representation of uncertainty in bus arrival times initially that would help them make quick decisions about when to get to the bus stop, given their tolerance for risk. So with a small number of dots, like 20 dots, um, you know, quantile dot plots support reasoning well or easily about uh, one-sided probability intervals, which is often what you care about when you're thinking about when should I get to the bus stop, because people can rely on what's called subitizing, the ability of the visual system um, to sort of immediately recognize small counts of objects, so you don't actually have to count them. Um, you can just sort of recognize, um, usually for things up to about four or five, what it is. And so we found that the bus riders could use these um, uh, and, and basically um, make better probability judgments. The other technique I call hypothetical outcome plots, where we're simply taking random draws from a target distribution, which might be a joint distribution in multivariate cases, and presenting each draw from the distribution as a frame in an animation without changing really the underlying visual encoding that the visualization, the static visualization would have used. Um, and the idea here is that we can show people sort of what uncertainty looks like and watch, they can watch it kind of play out. Um, so it's the nicest part is that we can express uncertainty um, using this discrete framing in a visualization that's already pretty complex in terms of its visual encodings. We don't have to add a new visual encoding. Um, and we've applied it, therefore, to cases where uncertainty would otherwise just be difficult to visualize. So it's hard to add an error bar to a lot of common you know, visualizations. So we've applied it to cases like I want to reason about uncertainty in community membership in a network diagram um, or uh, I want to think about um, things like icon arrays and how do I show people that there's uh, uncertainty in a rate, um, spatially interpolated maps, all of these techniques where we don't, we don't really have an uncertainty visualization approach. But of course, in doing this work, um, we've had to grapple with, you know, how do you evaluate these new techniques? And I've kind of skipped over that in talking about the techniques themselves, 
But it's really in evaluating these types of visualizations that I began to sort of recognize how in many ways um, in visualization, uh, us researchers really don't know what we're, what we're looking for, designing for. Why do we really want a better uncertainty visualization? So for example, a few years ago, I evaluated about 90 experimental evaluations of uncertainty visualizations, looking at what behaviors they hope to change, um, how, how they measured success. And I found that the ma vast majority of evaluations were about reading the data from the visualization. Things like comparing how accurately people could extract information like the max or the average from some display, or maybe how well they could rank random variables in a visualization. Um, or if they weren't about reading the data, they were about sort of how satisfied people felt in using the visualization. And this is problematic in a few ways. So there's no guarantee that just because someone can read the data from a visualization when you ask them, that they will actually use it and incorporate it in a decision under uncertainty. There's also no guarantee that someone who feels like the visualization is nice to use is actually going to benefit from that. Um, you know, we can think of like the New York Times election needle um, from 2016 where, you know, it was kind of an effect of uncertainty visualization. You couldn't ignore the uncertainty, but people hated it. Um, and so one thing that's hard to get at in particular when, when looking at things like accuracy or satisfaction in evaluation is how people are extracting information from the visualization and using it to update their beliefs or make decisions. Um, and one thing that, that we might want to, to think about is really the strategies people use to make decisions, um, not just you know, whether they can report statistics. So one generic yet, I think, pretty important type of uncertainty judgment is how people perceive what's called effect size. So given two distributions, one common measure of effect size is called the probability of superiority or a common language effect size, which is the proportion of the time or the probability that a random draw from one distribution will be higher than a random draw from the other. So you can think of it as sort of this, this measure of how effective an intervention is. And effect size is an interesting type of judgment to look at with uncertainty visualization because it should inform many decisions we make uh, from data. It's also the kind of judgment that you know, should be happening all the time when we look at visualizations and even when we're looking for patterns, we should be intuitively sort of seeing differences but weighing how important are these differences given the variation in each distribution. And so the question I started asking is you know, how well do different visualizations support effect size judgments and decisions? And in my initial research on hypothetical outcome plots, we would looked at how different uncertainty visualizations impact this kind of judgment. And I observed in particular that users of error bars and violin plots seem to map the difference in means they saw in a visualization to an effect size scale um, or probability scale. So if it was a big difference between means, they'd say this was a big effect or high probability um, of superiority, and if it was a small difference in mean, they'd say low probability, um, B is greater than A. And of course, this is not perfect because we should be also accounting for how much variance there is in, in each group, not just the distance between the means. Um, and so there's this question too, what defines a big or a small difference? Um, how are people sort of relatively judging the size of the mean distance and mapping that? Um, so the heuristic kind of implies that it's somehow relevant to you know, some other distances in the chart. So one possibility is that big and small um, differences between means are judged relative to the total space in a visualization. So in a 2D chart, you know, the total space that's relevant is uh, you know, the, the total vertical space um, on the y-axis. Um, so uh, in a recent experiment, we tried to, to look at this more closely. We asked people to judge effect size and state willingness to pay for a treatment given either 95% confidence intervals or 95% predictive intervals. So they got the corresponding interval information in text. So people who saw this chart got information about these intervals and vice versa. Um, same data set, so these are equivalent. We're just showing sampling distributions versus uh, measurement distributions. And um, we, we basically found that you know, the people who saw the, the chart with the CIs, they saw a big distance, you know, and they, they were much more willing to overpay for the treatment, and they said the effect size was much higher than they did here. So then we tried to look at, well, could we rescale the y-axis to make some of this, this difference go away. So what if we showed 95% CIs, but we scaled the y-axis to fit 
the 95% predictive intervals, would this help? And it did, in fact, attenuate some of the bias we were seeing. So not completely, but a bit. So people were somehow sensitive to the amount of visual difference or distance between distributions in a chart relative um, you know, to this, uh, these other cues that are set up you know, by the total distance in a chart. And so the most focused study we've done on this um, won a best paper at Viz last year. We wanted to more directly still test whether users rely on a distance between distributions as a proxy for effects. And so we did a mixed design controlled experiment on Mechanical Turk here. Um, and the previous study was on Mechanical Turk as well, I forgot to mention, where we showed distributions with multiple levels of variance on a common axis scale, such that at lower, dis at lower variance, the distance between means um, was not a good cue for effect size. Whereas at higher variance, if you were just looking at distance between means, it's, it, it mapped slightly better to um, the actual effect size in the data. Um, and so the task we used was modeled after a fantasy sports game where the user's job was to judge the improvement in team performance when adding a new player, this red distribution you see in the charts. Um, but the new player would cost them some money, um, but it would improve their chances of winning a bigger monetary award um, by getting a score over some threshold that we gave them. And so on each trial, we were asking users basically to do a couple of different judgments give us the probability of superiority or this measure of effect size, and then make a decision about whether you're gonna buy the new player or not. And the expected pattern of, a, of uh, effect size underestimation, if the person is using a, a distance-based heuristic with either high or low variance um, can be seen here. Um, so this is ground truth effect size, and this is perceived effect size. And if you're just looking at sort of distance between means, for low variance charts, you're gonna really be biased. So you're gonna really give a lot of responses close to 50% regardless of ground truth. It'll be a little better at high variance because with the high variance charts, um, distance between means is a better proxy for effect size. And so we wanted to compare uh, curves that we fit to our experiment participants to these curves. Um, and you know, the, the conditions that we showed people were based on this hypothesis we initially had that we should see behavior closer to these expected patterns where people are using the mean distance heuristic if we gave the participants some visualizations that made the means more salient. So we should see the biggest difference if we had a summary mark for the mean um, to visualizations that otherwise would make it hard to see the mean, things like hypothetical outcome plots where it's, it's kind of hard to estimate the mean, particularly when there's a lot of variance in the distributions. And so we assigned each participant to one of these four conditions, um, but they did an initial block um, either with means or without means, and then vice versa for a second block. So they are making a bunch of judgments, seen means or not means, given one of these, these different representations. And so I'll refer to the paper, um, or, or refer you to the paper for the full modeling details, because um, there's a lot of sort of nuanced results here I don't have time to go over. But basically we model their judgments in probability of superiority using a type of linear and log odds model that's commonly used for perceptual phenomena. And we're estimating basically the slopes of the curves that I showed you um, on the previous slide to measure the degree of bias or underestimation. We also looked at decision bias relative to utility maximizing decision. Um, both of these were Bayesian models, but I'm just gonna summarize the high level findings that were sort of informative for me as someone thinking about uncertainty visualization. So first we found that adding means had a small effect on probability estimates that was consistent with people using a mean distance heuristic more when they had a mean on the chart. Um, when we modeled the decision bias relative to optimal strategy, we saw kind of the same thing. So, when you added means, people were a little more likely to be biased in a way that we expected under this heuristic. But what was kind of surprising to us was that these were small differences. So you know, we expected to see a big difference where if you add means to certain charts, like the hypothetical outcome plots, you'd see a big change in behavior, but there was no real big change in behavior that, that we were seeing. And so the big question is, you know, why didn't adding the mean have a bigger effect? Are people not using the mean distance heuristic even when we show them means and so things look similar? Or are they using the mean distance heuristic whether or not we, we make them mean salient? Um, and it's this latter answer that explains um, you know, what, what we thought we saw. So we had also asked people to report the strategies they were using in making these judgments. And people by and large reported using some sort of distance heuristic 
looking at the visual space in the chart, looking at the distance between the distributions, and then mapping that somehow to either a decision or probability judgment. So this was surprising to us um, and kind of sobering to me as someone you know, thinking, oh, I'm doing research on uncertainty visualization. I'm trying to come up with these techniques, things like hypothetical outcome plots that will really force people to take uncertainty into account. You know, it's pretty sobering to realize that you know, these heuristics are super pervasive. And even when you give someone a visualization that is basically giving them this probability pretty directly, like through the animated lines, um, they ignore that. And they try to estimate the means and then look at the distance between them. So it really sort of points to how, you know, as researchers, one, we shouldn't just blindly trust that people know how to gauge the reliability of patterns, trends, or differences they see in, in charts. But also, we need to better understand what people are actually doing with visualizations, um, not just assume that because, you know, theoretically, some visualization should be better that is actually going to help people in the way we think. And I think what's tricky here is like we designed this experiment, you know, pretty carefully um, to get at a heuristic. We had the heuristic in mind. We learned a lot by doing so. But in general, designing these types of decision experiments is a hard process. There's a lot of chance for it to go wrong. So you have to reason carefully about, you know, what is the right task? What is the right payoff function? Um, you know, what's the data generating process to create the stimuli? And there's many, many chances to sort of end up with an experiment design that simply will not be powerful enough to differentiate, you know, the behaviors that you might think are going on. And so I think, you know, in recent years, um, what I've spent more and more time on after learning these kind of things through uncertainty visualization research is, is this idea of like, what is a good theory of what people should be doing with visualizations that will be kind of generalizable so that we're not trying to design these one-off decision experiments always. Um, but we have some theory of like, you know, what, how people learn from data. Um, and so three years or so ago, I began thinking about how Bayesian theory can be kind of generalized and help us think about learning from visualization and analysis. So, uh, for example, initially my student, um, former PhD student Yasso Kim and I started using Bayesian models of cognition to look at how well people seem to update their beliefs given visualized data. So the experimental paradigm we used involves either first eliciting or endowing people with prior beliefs about some parameter. Um, could be something like, you know, the proportion of people in some population that have a disease um, where, you know, we elicited or gave them prior beliefs and then we showed them data, like a survey of how many people in some sample have the disease. And the data sort of represents kind of the likelihood of different possible values of that parameter in this case, which is, it's a rate. We can then compare, uh, we can elicit their posterior beliefs and then compare those to sort of what we would expect if the user was a normative kind of Bayesian agent who perfectly updated their beliefs given the prior and that likelihood function. So it gives us a way to sort of think about like how much information are people getting from a visualization relative to what we might hope a rational agent would get. So we did a few large um, experiments on Mechanical Turk um, with this sort of paradigm um, and we varied parameters we asked people about, we varied the size of the data sets, we varied how they were visualized. And we learned quite a bit that I think I, for me as an uncertainty visualization researcher was kind of surprising because I'd never seen any of this come up in the literature. So for example, many of you maybe have heard of belief in the law of small numbers, which basically says that people over trust uh, information from small samples. We found there was sort of a robust tendency to over update from small samples. It was kind of small though in comparison to this much larger bias we saw where people would tend to under update from very large samples. So, you know, a big data set gives you a lot of information, but people would not update their beliefs nearly as much as a Bayesian would um, with that data. And so, um, you know, we've, we can use sort of a similar paradigm to then try to get at, well, why is it that people are sort of insensitive to data and especially as data sets get bigger, um, you know, is it because they distrust the source of the data and so they're discounting from that? Is it a perceptual thing like logarithmic perception affects um, how we perceive many quantities? Is it something perceptual? Is it a cognitive bias? And so in some follow-up work, we've tried to get at this, um, looking at sort of how much these different factors may come into play. Um, we also uh, can look within a framework like this and get a better sense of exactly how much something like a better uncertainty visualization might help. So 
in particular, we gave people different uncertainty visualizations, and then we calculated what we called the perceived sample size. So the sample size that the Bayesian would have needed to see in order to arrive at that, that set of posterior beliefs, given that prior. And we found that with a better uncertainty visualization, you can get people to perceive the, the data set size um, with a little less bias. So they per their perceived sample size is closer to what it should be. Um, but even good uncertainty visualizations and this other approach we did of uncertainty analogies where we basically told them how much weight the data sample should get relative to the prior, um, they did not really get rid of these biases. So there's a, this, this very strong tendency to under update. Um, and we could kind of like attenuate it a little, um, but not get rid of it. In another recent paper that was led by uh, Alex Kale, my PhD student, we used a different variant of Bayesian cognitive modeling, where we did several experiments where we gave people a data set along with graphs of several different possible causal models that might have generated the data. And we had sort of the typical you know, causal um, situation where you have a gene that causes the disease, a treatment that may or may not affect the disease, and some other unobserved factors. And so we basically wanted to, to give people data sets um, and give them possible causal models that might have generated the data. And we varied how we showed them the data. We gave them everything from like text contingency tables to you know, bar charts that mapped those tables, interactive uh, or filterable bar charts, uh, icon arrays and interactive icon arrays. And we wanted to see you know, how well could they differentiate which model was um, sort of more consistent with the data they were seeing. And we used a Bayesian cognition approach called causal support to do this, which is basically assigning posterior probability to some set of causal models given some data set. And again, we learned a lot by using this kind of normative model. So first, and um, again, insensitivity to sample size, which we were less surprised by this time, but uh, still very robust in this. We also learned that people were more sensitive when they were evaluating possible causal models to evidence that uh, falsified um, some model rather than evidence that would confirm or be in support of some model being the true data generating model. That was interesting to us. But most surprising was that visualization did not help. So giving people a text contingency table worked just as well as giving people visualizations, um, which was weird to us, again, because in, in, I think in particular, you know, when we talk about visual analysis and visual, visualization tools, um, we often sort of casually throw around words like, oh yeah, people do sort of causal attribution, they look at data, they figure out what's going on, and you know, then when we sit some people down and have them do this, again, these were, well, these were sort of lay people, they were not analysts, so it would be interesting to see what happened with an analyst population, but, but by and large, you know, people were, were very, very bad at this. Um, so, so what is going on? Do we really know how, how good people are at these very basic tasks? And so this line of work in Bayesian cognitive modeling is sort of informed how I think these days about visualization and its function. And a theory I like recently, which I would hope that Tukey you know, um, would like as well, kind of aligns with his idea about different phases of EDA and kind of what ties between these initial very exploratory phases where we're generating hypotheses as, and kind of these more probabilistic phases where we're trying to evaluate how much support data gives us for different explanations. Um, and so uh, the, the idea is that you know, a, a visualization supports what we call an, a model check. Um, and this, this goes back to speculation in the stats literature around 20 years ago about how visual inference, looking at a visualization and making inferences, is kind of related to st statistical testing. So in particular, Andrew Gelman proposed the idea that a model check could unite exploratory and confirmatory analysis which is, are, as I, as I said before, hard to, it's hard to sort of reconcile how these two phases of analysis go together. The idea is that you know, a good graph helps one check their intuitive statistical model about kind of how the data were generated. Um, and this idea always seemed quite powerful to me as someone who thinks a lot about like how exactly people draw inferences from visualization because it generalizes across you know, different phases of analysis. So for example, you know, say I'm a real estate agent and I have some housing sale data for my area, and I might construct plots like these using a tool like Tableau, and I'm looking for things like, well, is there an effect of neighborhood, or what's the effect on this relationship between different lot configurations, um, if I also cross it by neighborhood, or, you know, what's the, 
um, you know, the relationship between the, the square footage of living space and bedroom space, um, and as well as sale price, like how do those factors predict sale price? And in any of these, you know, visualizations that I might construct to answer these questions, I'm basically checking for main effects. I'm sort of laying out the data in ways that will allow me to look for certain visual signatures or certain visual patterns that will denote to me that there's a main effect. So is there, do I perceive a difference in the, in the location and scale of these distributions? That's sort of looking for a main effect on location and a main effect on, on variance. And so um, if you think about it, you know, in particular basic statistical graphics that we think about, um, things like histograms and bivariate scatter plots, are useful because all we have to do is look for deviations from symmetry in a lot of cases. And the visual system is very good at this. So we compare histograms to bell curves or other standard distributions depending on what the data look like to us and what they cue in our mind. Um, you know, we are looking for um, perceived, you know, relationships, um, bivariate relationships and scatter plots by simply looking, you know, how well the data fit a diagonal line, maybe some kind of polynomial that we're imagining. And some of the most effective plots that we see for formally checking model fit, um, things like quantile quantile plots or QQ plots or residual plots, are designed in such a way that the reference model that you're supposed to be checking is kind of built in to the design of the graphic. So, you know, for a residual plot, we want to see the residuals bounce randomly around the zero line. They should roughly form a horizontal band. And again, all we do is look for deviation from symmetry. And as we look at the plot, you know, you can imagine that we're implicitly sort of comparing the deviation we see, maybe, you know, how far off from center the horizontal line is. Um, and then maybe we're judging, you know, how bad is the deviation or how, how bad is the model misfit relative to like how bad it might be. So almost like we're doing sort of, you know, calculating kind of an internal p-value for like how important is what or how unlikely is what I saw. Um, and we can get more specific, and some of the work I've been doing recently sort of talks about this more specific um, formalization of this, where we think about our examinations of visualizations as akin to doing what's called a posterior predictive check in, in Bayesian statistics. Um, we can think of the posterior predictive distribution from a Bayesian model as kind of like a reasonable data generator. So under that model and that set of assumptions, what should the data look like? And it's a very powerful idea if we think about, you know, people and using graphs who might have implicit sort of models that they're maybe trying to imagine, like what would the data look like under this possibility that they're comparing to the visualization. So, you know, for one, we can design experiments given this kind of this idea or this modeling framework for, you know, specific data generating processes. And we can look at how well people do these, these internal model checks. But the other big reason for having kind of a, a theoretical sort of a um, uh, framework like this um, that's sort of generative is uh, that we can also think about, well, how should we design visual analysis, to visual analysis tools differently if we assume that people are sort of implicitly comparing these kind of um, models of, of how data were generated. So for example, you know, how can we help users of visual analysis tools, um, you know, do this more easily, even if they're not, you know, trained in thinking in terms of modeling um, you know, and statistics themselves. Um, and there's sort of the lower level idea. So if we think about, you know, um, analysis of visualizations and inference from visualizations as kind of a Bayesian process where people are checking models, some things um, seem like pretty obvious. So we should default to presenting the raw data, for instance, or we should be presenting uncertainty whenever someone wants to see, you know, statistics like means, because in a Bayesian framework, people need a sense of likelihood. And you know you have to see uh, the uncertainty to get a sense of likelihood. We can also think about things like supporting representations of prior um, prior uh, distributions or prior beliefs, which we might learn from past data. So if somebody's analyzing similar data, you know, once a month because they work for some firm and, and they're always doing like a monthly analysis, could we learn a prior that helps them then more easily judge what's um, what's unusual? about the data they're looking at, or could we elicit priors in cases um, where people might have them? So these are a few sort of basic ideas that immediately come to mind, but we can also go a little bit further and think about, um, you know, uh, what a system would look like that, that explicitly um, supported model checks 
in sort of a Bayesian framework like I've been talking about. So in current work with, uh, or led by my PhD student, Alex Kale, we're developing a Tableau-like system that also explicitly supports and recommends model checks to users. Um, so an analyst you know, is gonna interact with data similar to how they do in Tableau. They're gonna drag fields um, to specify you know, what kind of charts they wanna see. They get visualizations um, uh, from the tool, but then there's this model specification backend that enables explicit comparison of models to check against observed data. So for any plot, I have the option of also viewing model predictions that can help me understand how different combinations of variables explain or don't explain what I think I'm seeing in a graph. So I can manually specify models, for instance, if I'm comfortable with that. Um, so we kind of built in like a little model bar into the visual analysis tool. You can imagine something like Tableau or Power BI. Um, or I can, if I'm not comfortable writing regressions myself, I can accept recommendations from the tool about what models might be relevant for me to check against what I'm seeing. So the core question behind doing this is kind of like what's the right alignment or coupling between the models that people should check and the visualizations. So a visualization in some ways you could say implies a model because you have some number, you know, say of, of predictor variables. So here we have day of week, we have some outcome variable here. This is forest fire data. So we're looking at the log of the amount of uh, uh, land that was burned. Um, and so, you know, I can look at um, predictions from a model that incorporates um, the variables that are in my chart specification and try to see, like, do I see any discrepancies? If I'm predicting log area burned by day of week, you know, how good are my predictions at, um, at sort of replicating the, the location and the, the scale of each of these distributions I see? Um, in other cases, you know, showing someone predictions from a model based on the chart specification they're looking at might help them avoid like obvious failures of reasoning. So here, imagine I'm looking at some self-tracking study data. I might care how hours of sleep per night seems to relate to fitness level. So I have hours of sleep and fitness level, and then I'm dividing it by the reported sex of the person using the tracker and whether they've used a sleep tracker before. And I might, you know, working in something like Tableau, um, you know, want to see a trend line because it's, it's sort of, you know, I'm really interested in, in how these relationships between fitness level and hours of sleep change under these two, um, you know, nominal covariates that I'm looking at. And maybe I think I see, oh, there's maybe some interaction effect where for males who have previously used trackers, um, you know, there's sl a slightly more positive trend. Um, as fitness level goes up, they sleep more. Um, but you can imagine that if I could see predictions from a model, in this case, fit to the structure of my graph. So I'm looking basically for main effects of sex, previous use of sleep tracker, and fitness level on hours of sleep. Um, and I'm including all interactions. This could help the user realize that like, oh yeah, even though I think I see like a slight interaction, it's totally just noise, you know, based on the low sample size of my data. Um, and so there's, you know, both this opportunity to help people reason about variables that explain their data, but also recognize when things are wrong or when they're, when they're drawing conclusions that aren't supported. And a design hypothesis we have is also that in many cases it might be useful to toggle between models implied by a view um, that someone's looking at and models that are sort of adjacent um, to, the, to the, the model implied by the view. So here, you know, I'm seeing um, what happens when I add month to predict lot area. So if I don't have month, I see, see one thing. If I add month, I can suddenly see that I explain the data a bit better. This example is actually cheating a little because I also got rid of um, some zero, um, zero values, but you can kind of get the idea. It's sort of helping me reason about which, which factors in my chart actually matter, which is what visual analysis is about, but visual analysis is a little more approximate. Um, there, of course, there's plenty of challenges in trying to do something like this. So first, feasibility. Um, realistically, you know, complexity has to be constrained. We probably need analytical solutions in many cases to fit the models. Also, the types of users who might benefit from this are probably not the people who are comfortable, you know, running regressions in R. Um, and so we have to think about, you know, 
if we're trying to walk people through sort of checking model fit, what kind of scaffolding or visual guidance do we have to give them to, to allow them to do that? Um, how do we let them customize things, which as they get comfortable with modeling, they might want to do. Um, but also, perhaps most importantly, you know, how do we avoid overwhelming people? So if we're going for people who aren't expert statisticians already, who could benefit from a little more rigorous sort of model checking as they do visual analysis, you know, how do we not, um, not just make them want to give up because it seems hard? And I think that's a, you know, a particularly hard question. And, um, you know, one that, you know, really motivates why we're building this system. I think it's hard to answer whether something like this could work well without actually trying it. Um, and I'm fully open to the idea that actually maybe, maybe people when they do visual analysis, you know, they can do okay without this explicit support. You know, maybe we're building these tools and we're, we're sort of, um, you know, helping them find patterns and maybe that's okay. Um, but I think we really sort of need theory to sort of ground actual evaluations of this kind of intuition we might have. And so, so yeah, so I'm, I could see it going either way and I'm, I'm just sort of curious what we learn. Um, I have just one or two minutes. Are we good on time? Okay. So anyway, the main argument, you know, I wanted to make today is for more theory and visualization and in HCI more broadly, really. So I've spent a while on how normative theories of statistical inference can be applied to um, designing visualization tools. But I also see a big gap in visualization research when it comes to kind of formalizing the problems that we study and the approaches we take more broadly. So there's a question, you know, is all this trouble we go through as researchers trying to find like the best visualization or best set of encodings or best interaction really worth it? Um, and a, I think really a big open question is what sort of inference problems do we think we're addressing with visualization or do we want to be addressing? So in stats, there's something that's sort of, sort of casually called the anthropic principle, which says that, you know, there's only certain problems where statistical modeling can help us. So if the signal is huge relative to the noise, you don't need statistical modeling. And I would assume that we would all agree that visualization should suffice here if the signal is huge relative to noise. And then on the other hand, you know, if the, the noise is so huge compared to the signal that we're sort of hopeless even with statistical modeling, presumably we're hopeless with visualization as well. Um, but then there's this middle region. So do, do we think that this is where most of the, the applications where visualization can help um, lie? And if so, you know, how do we get away without supporting um, you know, inference and uh, helping people check the reliability of their decisions? Are people convincing themselves that things don't exist? Or do we think that people are, are sort of following up every visual analysis they do with formal statistical modeling? Is that the way we approach the design of our tools? Like we don't have to worry about the other stuff. Um, you know, I think there's also this possibility that, you know, for some types of problems, um, visual analysis is robust enough on its own. But how do we actually state what those problems are? I think if you asked anyone in the field, you know, to argue for when visualization alone is sufficient, they would not be able to tell you that. And so sort of final um, project I'll just briefly share and then, then I'll, I'll wrap up is that um, I've started to work kind of more with theory colleagues, um, which I find quite exciting. Um, as an HCI or visualization person, we tend to be very empirical and not theoretical. And so there's a few projects that have been coming out of this that I think are cool. Um, we did some work thinking about visualization in strategic settings where we sort of defined what we call the visualization equilibrium. So what is the display that induces the behavior that is actually predicted by the display? Um, but in a current project, we're designing a framework to try to answer questions to help us predict sort of the potential benefit that a more expressive visualization might have across a broader range of data conditions than we can usually study in experiments or a broader set of decision tasks. So for example, what can we say about the stakes involved when we decide to aggregate data by default in some tool? Um, and we're doing this basically by relying on comparisons to how much a rational agent could benefit from more information about distributions. Um, and then we can use that, that difference of, for the rational agent using basically optimal scoring rules um, to, to bound how well any behavioral agent could, could do with the, the, the two visualizations, one's more expressive and less. We can plug in different assumptions about the data generating process or even different decision tasks and then, and then reason more formally about the impacts on visualization judgments. So I'm excited about this work. It's still very early. 
Um, but really, because I do see this big gap in how we think about visualization and what problems it solves, um, and things like aggregation, which are so fundamental to visualization practice. So I'll stop there. I have to, of course, thank all my collaborators, my PhD students and RAs, um, and thanks for listening and, and inviting me. So happy to take any questions. Thank you for this. I was wondering in your work, how do you separate, for example, people's discomfort with uncertainty as a whole and the tendency towards like making sense of data to the methods that you're evaluating? So I think, I mean, people's discomfort and tendency to ignore uncertainty is kind of um, what a lot of my work has sort of looked at, I think, because it's sort of inevitable when you're studying any sort of like displays to help people with reasoning under uncertainty. I mean, I think the heuristics is one example. Um, like people will ignore uncertainty. Um, it's easier to do so. Um, you know, there's even studies in behavioral econ that show that in many cases it's optimal to do so, like to ignore it to some for certain types of, of tasks. And so, you know, I think my my goal there is just. Um, you know, how do we use like empirical experiments to try to really hone in on exactly how they're ignoring it? Um, so some of the studies I was showing, I would say like that's the way we're engaging with it is by trying to figure out, um, you know, in particular, like when people are ignoring uncertainty information, they're usually substituting something else in. So like, how do we figure out what they're substituting in? So then we can, you know, reason about how bad it is. Um, so some of the visual distance stuff, I would say. It's like that, but it is hard to design. Um, it's hard to design studies to get at these things, and in particular, often um, multiple heuristics um, that might seem meaningfully different to us will be very hard to statistically differentiate through experiments. And so, that's partially, I mean, kind of the motivation for theory as well is that um, you know sometimes like empirical data alone can't answer the questions. But I don't know if that was there anything more specific or. I was wondering um, more specifically, like on the, for example, the New York Times needle mm -hmm. example, right? It's for someone who actually genuinely cares about trying to understand it, it is yes. useful. But then if someone, like non experts especially, would just get turned off and not want to use this yeah, yeah. at all. So, like, no, I think that's a huge problem, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why, I mean, that's why my, my questions right now are getting more towards like how robust are these heuristics people use? Because I think, um, you know, there is an aversion to uncertainty in general. Like this is what the behavioral economists spend all their time doing, you know, judgment, decision making people think about this. Um, and I think, yeah, to, under, to, to develop uncertainty visualizations, for sure, we need to be thinking kind of even outside the, the bounds of any particular study, but like, what happens if in the real world people never even use this thing in, to begin with? Um, so yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think we need to broaden our scope as researchers to, to think about like the other alternatives people have for interacting with that type of data in general. Um, and I haven't seen anyone do that well. Um, yeah, including myself. So it's a good point. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that's, uh, that's what I'm more hopefully working towards in some ways. Uh, yeah. So great talk. I'm wondering, uh, maybe I have two questions. But, okay. So the first question uh, about uh, some of your earlier work on uncertainty visualization through animation. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, you know, uh, basically how, you know, how you approach this when there are very large data sets where it would take a long time to, to view the, oh, you know, all yeah. of the things. So we're not, we're not yeah. showing... Um, yeah, so typically, I mean, you could just do bootstrap resampling, but you don't, the idea is you don't have to see all of them, like what you would want, and we've, we've done a little of this only, but like you want to sort of like um, stack the set of draws so that even in a small number, people are getting a representative depiction of the distribution, and there's ways to do that. We haven't actually evaluated any of it, but, but yeah, I think that's... Um, that's a that's a big question. There's also hybrid approaches, and it's interesting there because then you do run into this trade-off where if you give people animation and a static summary in the background, um, which is actually what the New York Times needle was doing, it had both the, the needle and and a sort of color visualization in the back. You always then you, then you run the risk of them falling back on the static stuff. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of interesting questions still there, in particular with animation of uncertainty that are left to be looked at in studies. Um, but yeah, 
yeah, I think yeah, someone should do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I have sure. uh, another question, too. And so I think, you know, this role of cognitive biases that people have and the heuristics that people are using mm -hmm. in the decision-making processes. Um, and I thought, yeah, the work that you did kind of uncovered some really interesting ones. And of course, there's kind of like, you know, again, thinking about how, you know, decision science and other things have been applied to HCI and maybe visualization and uh, to some extent as well. Uh, you know, there's the sets of like common, you know, cognitive biases. Yeah, I hate that have. kind of stuff, honestly. Because yeah. <laughs> often it's just sort of like, it's, it's like we have to define the biases pretty specifically, I think, if we're going to talk about them. And sometimes that gets skipped. Yeah, um, and so I in guess HCI. that's kind of my question is yeah. basically, oh, you have some heuristic set of heuristics uh, that people have, and mm -hmm. then, you know, your work is really looked at, you know, very specific strategies. Mm -hmm. And I guess how do we bridge this gap or where, basically, if we have to run, you know, a, as you mentioned, design these studies very challenging, mm -hmm. do we need to, you know, basically redo everything that the behavioral economists have done? I don't think so. Or? I think we need to be more careful when we look at what they're doing. I think, I mean, the cognitive bias this stuff going on in visualization does often annoy me because I think they're drawing from psychology and in the definition of biases were never well defined to begin with. And so, um, yeah, so things like risk aversion even, like, um, you can frame it in various ways, and it someone seems both risk seeking and risk you know averse um, in the same setting and so I think my biggest issue is is that, but I mean, I think in general um, like i 've learned a ton from behavioral economics, um, they will try to come up with formal models of some of these things, and in particular. Um, also in mathematical psych, where some of this stuff about like people are reasoning in terms of samples, so not really reasoning in terms of full distributions, but some of these heuristics are more like I'm taking a few samples. Um, people have looked at like how that can be optimal in various settings, and so I think as cognitive biases comes into HCI and Viz, we need to be careful to not just assume this very negative, high-level framing, um, but also think about like. What can we say about when this is a, when this is bad and when this is good? Um, and that's uh, like I kind of got it in the talk. I think I've moved moving towards a more theoretical lens, at least in some of my research, just because it is so hard to differentiate these things um, uh, unless we have some theoretical way of reasoning as well as the empirical. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Did you have one? So on the point of bad definitions for bias, yeah. um, I was curious how much you've seen in your work, um, like what biases from the participants on Mechanical Turk do you think may limit some of the... Yeah, no, I think, I mean, there I think people are even more likely to satisfy us, and I've kind of moved away from doing Turk experiments, like sometimes my students still do them, but I... Um, I feel like I learn more now from smaller studies on analysts, but it's also because my, my questions have changed a bit. But I think, I mean, a lot of the, the traditional sort of Kahneman and Tversky bias stuff, um, you know, they did try to show that a lot of these things affect experts just as much as um, lay people. Um, I haven't done as much work as I'd like in trying to, like, take what we find about some of this stuff with, like, causal inference and what people are sensitive to and then apply it, see if it still applies to to analysts, um, but yeah, I mean, I think in general, I don't know that Turkers are different from other people. I think they're just, they're even more likely to satisfy because um, they're, they're trying to do as many tasks as they can. And um, so yeah, there's, I think with all of these different populations, you run into some trade-offs and just trying to, um, yeah, ultimately there's a lot of work we need to do, I think, to, to to be able to compare better, like what affects who most. But things like the non-belief in the law of large numbers, which um, some of the behavioral economists have just recently started to talk about, um, I think those kind of things are, I mean, they're framed at a level that they're, they're really baked into like human perception. Um, uh, so I don't think, I think for a lot of the core bias stuff, um, the stuff that's well-defined, um, they're they're trying to say things about people in general and not just certain pools, but yeah, it's always a question and it always needs to be followed up on, to be sure. Okay, then if there aren't any further questions, then I think we'll finish cool. this up for. Thanks for having me.